Hey, my name is Jimmy Cooper, and I'm the minister of worship here at Open Door Church. We're so glad that you took time out of your day to come study God's Word with us. At Open Door Church, it's our mission to love God and make His gospel known. If you live in the Raleigh area, we invite you to come join us in person at either our 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. service. Now let's hear from God's Word. Good morning. If you are a guest or a visitor to Open Door, it means a whole lot that uh, you chose this place to worship on a Sunday morning. We're studying First Peter, and we're in chapter 3 uh, in our study. Cain, I missed you last week. We were serving uh, some of our network churches and church plants in the Greenville, South Carolina area, and then we spent a few days in Atlanta or had the opportunity to address about 100 young uh, pastors in our convention and uh, we walked away very encouraged as to what the Lord's doing in our church plants and other churches and amongst the young leaders and so uh, I want to give you greetings from all of them and of course we we always miss being here and we absolutely love worshiping with our church family. We're also super encouraged about this past weekend here at Open Door. We had our marriage weekender, had about a hundred adults actually focus on marriage and uh, I felt the fellowship was rich and hopefully the instruction will bear a lot of fruit. And we're going to sort of finish our thoughts about Christian marriage in our study of 1 Peter 3 this morning as we consider what does a holy marriage look like. Now, now back in the day, uh, Christian marriage was called holy matrimony. Holy matrimony. But I, I fear that some of the holiness has left the matrimony these days. I can remember uh, when I first started officiating weddings where there, there was a, a bit of a, a desire that the couples had to, to make sure that what took place during the, the ceremony was sacred, that, that it was bound up in this mystery of what marriage represents. And, and I remember as I would uh, help the, the bride and the groom exchange their vows that, that we would always end with this statement, according to God's holy law. I make this covenant according to God's holy law, holy marriage. Times are changing. I mean, not every time, but it does seem like these days that couples who want to get married, uh, they, they still want a ceremony, but they seem more invested in the party afterwards than they are what will take place during the union. And there's been a few weddings that I've been asked to be a part of, and just to be honest, I, I felt like my role during the marriage ceremony was, was more like an actor than a reverend who represents God. Rather than being that, that representative of, of God that, that is joining these two in some mystical union so that they would display the holiness of God in their marriage, I, I, I felt a little bit more just like a bystander, more, more like that classic reverend in The Princess Bride. Marriage. Sweet marriage. Has your marriage lost its holiness? Has it lost its holiness? If you want to be married, do you want a holy matrimony? That's what I want to think about as, as we reflect on 1 Peter 3. Because I want to make sure that if you are married today, that, that your union is still sacred and experiencing the grace of God. If you desire to be married someday, then I, I want for this to be a preparation for you. That there would be a, a desire for you to be holy now so that you can enjoy holy matrimony later. 
This is what 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 are about. The holiness of marriage demands our mutual obedience to God's law. And God will supply all of the necessary grace for couples to enjoy the gift of life. The grace of life is ours if we submit ourselves in obedience to the law of God. In the same way, chapter three and verse one, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that even if some of them disobey the word, they may be won over without a word by the way their wives live when they observe your pure and reverent lives. What Peter is trying to tell the Christian in this letter is that the submitted life is the holy life and the holy life is the good life because it imitates the life of Christ. And Jesus lived the submitted life. Every moment of his earthly life, he submitted himself to his Father's will. The submitted life is the holy life. It's the good life. And even when Christ was mistreated, and even when Christ was, was crucified by the Roman authorities, he submitted his life. He didn't refuse, didn't reject. He suffered, leaving us an example. And in the very same way, Peter is asking Christians to submit to the authorities that God has established and ordained for us. He established these authorities for our good, even though sometimes the authorities in our lives don't necessarily wish for our good. We are still to submit to them. To governing authorities, we submit to them and we grant them honor. Honor the king, Peter says. Uh, to our managers uh, in the workplace, those who provide our income, we submit to them. We honor them. And just as God has ordered government and ordered structure in the workplace, he has also given good gospel order to the family. He's given every marriage structure and roles and opportunities to obey his holy law. He orders husbands, he orders wives, and even children all have an important role to play in the home. And God had set this up from creation forward. It's really important for you, as I read these verses today, for you to not conclude, well, Peter must be dealing with some special situation among certain women in the church who are a little bit unruly. And that has nothing to do with me today. No, it has everything to do with you today because what Peter is drawing back on is from creation itself. You see, before there even was sin, God had ordered the family. He gave structure to each person within the marriage. And we see that very clearly in the scriptures. And the order that he gave has everything to do with the order in which Adam and Eve were created. Now, you may have never thought about this before, but this is actually very important that God did not create Adam and Eve at the same time. He didn't create Adam and Eve at the same time. He actually made one person first, and then he created a, a, a person second. Now, they both bear the image of God, and they both were able to express the image of God to the rest of creation. And all the human life that God has created or has been born since Adam and Eve is sacred to God and should be sacred to us. 
But the fact is that Adam was made first, and because Adam was created first, he was given the role as head of his family. Head uh, implies authority. Just as Christ is the head of the church, his headship implies authority. And then Eve was created second, and Eve was created from Adam, and Eve was created for Adam. And then she then had a very special role in the marriage to be Adam's companion, to be Adam's helper. Adam had a very important role in the marriage to provide loving leadership, to actually imitate God's loving, authoritative leadership over us. And then Eve was also given a very special role in the marriage in that she would be the one that would bear children so that they both could fulfill the commission that they were given to fill the earth with people made in his image. And so this, this good gospel order that, that, that God designed uh, allowed for each individual to have a, a sacred privilege uh, and role within the family unit. Children were given a role as well. If you're a child, listen, listen to Pastor Duane, you have a role in your family. Now here's your role. Be obedient to mom and dad. Can I go to children to say amen? Okay, children, thank you. Now children, you have to be more than a hearer of me, you gotta be a doer. That's your role. You're to be obedient. And your mom is to be submissive to your dad. And your dad is to supply loving leadership. He is to be the head of the home. And for a wife to yield to her husband as head is to agree that God knows what he's doing and that God has provided good order in the family. And when every individual is displaying their role, it brings pleasure to God. It brings glory to God. And no one can make a wife be submissive. That's something she has to choose to do. It's something she has to willingly choose to do. And I'm not a woman nor a wife, but I know that submission comes much easier when the husband is providing the Christ-like leadership that he is supposed to be providing. And I know that submission is much more challenging when the husband is being disobedient to God's word and even unruly. But nonetheless, there are gospel purposes for living the submitted life, even, and actually what Peter is, uh, is dealing with in this passage is he is speaking most specifically to the wives who are married to unbelieving husbands or disobedient husbands. And he simply says to them, submit yourselves to your husbands anyway so that even if they are disobeying the word, they may be won over, won over to God, won over to belief, won over to holiness by watching you. That they may be won over without a word by the way their wives live as they observe your pure and your reverent behavior. So you see, wives, there are much bigger purposes for you to display your role to your husbands. And part of that is that God actually might use you as an instrument for the redemption and the sanctification or possibly even the salvation 
of your husband. And in understanding these bigger purposes, these gospel purposes should help you appreciate the privilege you have in being a wife. And Paul actually agrees with Peter in 1 Corinthians 7 as he's also addressing wives who are married to unbelieving husbands. And basically what Paul's instruction is, is, is look, as, as, as long as your husband desires for you to stay in the home and remain married, stay. Stay. Now, if he's abandoned you, and a husband cannot abandon his wife by way of abuse. It happens too often. And a husband cannot abandon his wife just by leaving. And then if he abandons you, then okay, then, then you might have to let him go. But, but if he desires for you to stay, stay. This is what Paul says. If any woman has an unbelieving husband and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy by his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy by a believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they, they are now holy. There is something incredibly sanctifying about a godly wife and mother in the home, that her holiness can actually radiate out towards her husband and her children, that eventually she might become that instrument that God uses to bring salvation to him and her children. And if he is a believer, but he's just being disobedient, uh, then maybe it is through her life, not her words, but her character and her behavior that God may use to redeem that guy. So it is very important, wives, that you recognize the sanctifying influence that you can have on your family, the saving influence that you might have. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. You can raise your hand, and I'm already going to assume I, I know the answer. But how many of you would say that, that coming to faith, your salvation, was due in part to the influence of a godly mother or grandmother? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I knew that would be the case. So many of us. So many of us. And if that was not your situation, then you have an opportunity to begin that grace in your families. And, and exactly uh, what Peter is talking about provides every wife the opportunity. Win your husband over, not by your words, by your actions as you display the purity and the reverence of Christ to your husband. Allow God to use that to stimulate his faith. Purity and reverence are greatly needed commodities, especially in our homes. And in this sense of purity, that, that, that implies holiness, right? The, the, the concept is, is cleanliness, moral purity reverence, that, that a wife would have an awe and an, and an, an esteem for God, and that she would reflect the holiness of God to her family. You see, that, that's what makes her beautiful. And so Peter is going to now talk a little bit more about real beauty and he says in verse three, don't let your beauty consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles, wearing gold jewelry or fine clothes, but rather what is inside the heart, that imperishable quality of a gentle and a quiet spirit, this has great worth to God. The true beauty 
of a godly wife. It's, it's not external, it's internal. Now, ladies, you can fix your hair, it's okay. Not, 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 not many of you are blessed with the hair that my wife has. My wife's hair is glorious just as it is. And I know some of you gotta pay a little bit more attention to yours, that's fine. It's, it's okay to wear some jewelry. Just, just don't go overboard with it. Don't idolize it. It's okay to wear nice clothes, but honestly, that's not who you are. It's, it's okay. I, mean, I just want you to know that God really could care less about your hair, your jewelry, or the clothes you choose. The gaze of God goes much deeper than that. He looks to the heart. And I just find it actually comforting that the same scenario culturally that the women during Peter's life had to deal with is the same today, that there are these cultural standards that, that women feel like they have to conform to in order to be beautiful. It's always been cultural standards, always. There's always been an image or an icon of beauty. That's called an idol, by the way, if you want me just to give you the biblical term of that. And once a woman idolizes whatever culture declares to be beauty, then you're an idolater. And men, if you demand your women to look like that, you're an idolater as well. Can I just be honest with you? Stop idolat being an idolater. Stop it. For a Christian man to promote idolatry, what could be worse than that? Rather, how about we do what God does? and care so much more about what's going inside our wives than what's happening outside. God, he cares about the style of your heart, not the style of your clothes. As a matter of fact, the Bible is very clear on this, and uh, you'll be happy to know, women, that the Bible would want you to be clothed, first of all. <clears throat> but, the Bible tells you to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. That's what the Bible tells you to be clothed with. The Bible actually says it. Whenever you find this statement put on, Paul in his letters is referencing clothing. He's using an analogy. Put on, put on clothes, but he's saying put on Christ. Put on the image of Christ. He said, put off the old person. Put on Christ. You should be adorned with the image of Christ, which allows you to represent and display the gentle and the quiet spirit of Christ in his meekness. You should, be, you should put on display the peace of God, the peace of Christ to your family. Yes, put on clothes, but put on the clothing of Christ Jesus. Display the fruit of the Spirit. That's what will make you beautiful. And love and joy and patience and kindness and meekness and self-control. When you adorn yourself like that, you are beautiful to God and you are beautiful to godly men. And true beauty will never come from what you see in your bathroom mirror. True beauty, women, comes only from the reflection that is revealed in the mirror of this book. And so be beautiful. God will give you all the grace and help that you need to do that. And now let me say this very clearly. As we raise our daughters, we must teach them what true beauty is. As you raise your daughters, every time you see something that represents Christ, you call that beautiful. And you declare them to be beautiful. When you see the beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, when you see the fruit of the spirit being born through their character, you say, oh, you're beautiful right now. I find you beautiful. 
don't you dare equate beauty to their physical appearance. Now you can call them cute and you can pay some attention to them because they deal with stresses and peer pressure from the outside world and, and, and they more than anyone feel this desperation of how am I supposed to be beautiful when I never will look like that. And, and if any person, it just takes one person to make some small critique of their hair or their eyes or their nose or whatever and it just devastates them and that's where you come along and say, you forget about that. None of that is what makes you beautiful. And you tell them what beauty is. And you convince them. And they will believe you. If you call them beautiful, they will believe you. And then you do become salvific and sanctifying in their lives. There are just few things that God desires more of a woman than to display the true beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit. Few things that God considers more valuable than this great worth for a woman who is gentle, calming, mild, great value for the, for the woman who has the ability to just hush chaos and bring peace when there is seemingly unrest and no peace is found. Never harsh, never harassing, simply displaying the, the strong gentility of Christ. My granny was like this. My grandmother on my mother's side was married to a loud, harsh drunk for over 50 years until he passed. And my grandmother won him over without a word. Now for decades, every Sunday, because my granny, uh, she wouldn't drive, my grandfather would drive her to church and drop her off and he'd go gamble or get drunk on Sunday. And, and my granny didn't like his lifestyle. And to be honest, whenever I visited them, I was scared of my grandfather. He was a harsh man. But there was just something about granny who made that farmhouse peaceful and desirable to be in. It was the peace she brought to the home that won everybody over, even without a word. You know, many, many years later, many decades later, my grandpa stopped gambling and getting drunk on Sunday and he started going to church, the granny. That old rascal put on a tie. <laughs> I am one of several grandchildren who've committed their life to full-time ministry in part due to Granny's influence. Now, that's of great value to God. And all of you women have an opportunity to be sanctifying and salvific in your deportment. And Peter actually is, is going to call upon the Old Testament scriptures to help us uh, with an illustration of this. How can you display a beautiful and a, and a faithful heart? And Peter just simply says, look to the faithful women of old. For example, Sarah, who was married to Abram. And one day, Abram says, okay, dear, we got to leave. What do you mean leave? We're leaving our home. Where are we going? I'm not quite sure. But we're going to have to live in tents, and most likely in the desert. And off she goes. Off she goes. And they happened at one point in their journey, because they were nomads, that a famine came about, and Abraham said to Sarah, um, we're going to have to go to Egypt. Okay, let's go. And they get to Egypt and uh, Abraham says, um, uh, don't treat me like I'm your husband. Act like I'm your brother. Why? Well, just do it. And he tries to pawn her off on Pharaoh. She obeys. 
and then Abraham kept saying, uh, you know what, there's a promise for our faithfulness. Let's just stay faithful because the Lord has promised us that we're going to have children upon children upon children. And Sarah says, yeah, I'm 99. And you, old fella, are 100. <laughs> and then the Lord met. Abraham out there in the desert under the tent and he said I'm going to keep my promise to you and, and he said to Abraham you know next year at this time you're going to have a son and now Sarah being the good wife was listening in like what are the men talking about and she overheard that and she laughed and she made the statement yeah my Lord is going to give me a child that old fella, but she called him Lord, little L Lord, little L. E even in her laughter, she honored him. And she actually thought it was funny, which we all do, right? A 99-year-old woman, a 100-year-old guy, and they're going to have a kid. And they did. And they did. Listen, wives, those who want to be a wife. For in the past... The holy women, holy women, who put their hope in their husband, what does it say? Say it, ladies. In, in God. They put their hope in God. They also adorn themselves, they adorn their hearts, their inner person, in the same way, submitting to their husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you become daughters of Sarah when you do what is good and you do it without any fear or intimidation, which means you're not going to let the world convince you that this is not the way that you should be. You're not going to bow to cultural pressures. You're going to say, no, nope, I am who I am. God has made me to be this way. And he finds it beautiful when I display my role out of reverence for him, in obedience to him, and in hope of God. I can remember when my kids were smaller and we'd be having family dinner and my wife would stop the meal and she'd say, okay, children, I want you to understand something that this is our kingdom and your dad is the king of this house. I was like, yes, I am. And I would tell the kids, and, and your mom is my beautiful queen. And, and y'all are nothing but serfs. <laughs> just, you're just sponges, living off the land. One day you're going to leave us and go cleave and start your own kingdom. Amen? Can a wife be submissive to her husband and still have equality? Absolutely yes. Of course, yes. God declares you to be equal in his eyes and to have great value and worth. And yet you can display your role as a submissive wife. Should then a wife who is equal demand equal authority in her home? Absolutely not. That would be in disobedience to God's words. That would not fulfill the good order that God has placed in the home. Can a wife display a gentle and a quiet spirit even to an unruly husband? Yes, she can. Because Christ has given us an example. And even if you're asked to suffer, he's provided you the means to endure and to be holy. So women, don't, don't desire external beauty, expensive possessions, costly clothes, Adorn your heart, not your body. Be a daughter of Sarah and never be intimidated by another woman. Never be intimidated by another woman's looks or affluences. Never be intimidated by cultural standards that are, are being placed upon you. The only demand that you have is the word of God. Adorn yourself with godliness. Become beautiful to God 
and godly men will find you beautiful as well. Now, verse seven I find fascinating because um, Peter is giving us an obvious a theme of those who are under God-given authorities submit to them. Uh, citizens, submit to your government leaders. Uh, workers, servants in the workplace, in, in the homes, submit to your masters, your managers. Uh, wives, in, the, in the, the good order that God gives your marriage, submit to your husbands. I, I get that. So what's next? Well, now he actually stops and says, by the way, you who are the authorities, I've got some instruction for you as well. So th this is really important because Paul, Peter is actually saying, now, husbands, I got something for you too. <laughs> husbands, in the same way, means you are in a different category than your wives, but I have instruction for you as well. And here's the instruction. It's very simple and it's absolutely impossible to fulfill. Live with your wife in an understanding way. Thank you, Lord. Live with your wives in such a way that you totally understand her. Okay, raise your hand if you figure that out. That would be zero of us. And yet, this is our instruction. We have to live with our wives in an understanding way, recognizing them as being different by God's design. Now, the way Peter says this is, as with a weaker partner or a weaker vessel in the older translations, but remember, vessel has to do with your physical body. Vessel, the Bible talks about vessel. He's talking about the physical body. Live with your wives in an understanding way as someone who is female. That's all he's saying. Weaker does not have, it doesn't have anything to do with, with weaker intellectually, of course not, or weaker emotionally, of course not, and definitely not weaker spiritually because as we know, there are probably more spiritually mature and strong women than there are men. He's just simply saying, guys, you've married a girl. Figure that out. She's not you. Can I get an amen? Guys, aren't you glad you didn't marry a you? Can I get an amen? Well, then quit, quit demanding that she be you then. Quit demanding it. Let her be female. Let her be feminine. Let her be exactly who God made her to be. And don't get frustrated by that. Figure her out and understand her. If you don't, God will not listen to your prayers. Yikes. That's what it says. We are commanded by God to understand our wives. We have to take the time to know her, recognize the differences between a man and a woman. And by the way, can I just say, these are not interchangeable. You cannot change your gender. Of the millions upon millions of human cells in my wife's body, every single one of them declares her to be female. There's not one cell in her body that says otherwise. Every cell of the millions and millions of cells in my body says I'm a male. We are different by design. All of that brings God glory and the beauty of what he has put together. And so we are who we are by God's good and gracious order. That's why it's so hard for me to figure her out because I'm not a female. And after 31 next week, Thursday, it'll be 32 years. Thank you, honey, for sticking with me. I'll still be figuring her out. It's like the old couple who, they were trying to give advice to this couple that was getting married and, and, and the older wife says, don't worry, after, at, at some point in time, you'll just know each other's thoughts. 
And the old guy's just like, <clears throat> well, I'm still working on that one. <laughs> I, I need to not just recognize her differences, I need to rejoice in them. I mean, are you not astounded how blind our culture is? That it's now making statements like it's okay for a biological male to play competitive sports with a biological female. And it's okay because the biological male is choosing in this moment not to be male. Okay, that's just simply ridiculous. Yes. Non scientific <laughs> and not biblical. Like, I don't boast in the fact that I can beat my wife in an arm wrestling contest 10 out of 10 times. I don't boast in that. I regret the fact that I can't beat the rest of you guys in an arm wrestling contest 10 out of 10 times. That, that, that leads to my humility. I'm not superior to my wife. I just want to honor her for being who God made her to be. She is a saint of God. And now I'm going to say one more thing. I need to, to conclude this. But I want you to focus on this phrase. Just give me another minute. Right there in the middle of verse 7, where it says, showing them honor. That's what, that's what we do as husbands to our wives. We show them honor. As the reason why we show them honor is because our wives are co heirs of the grace of life. Now, I want you to focus on the word co heir. Co heir. Every Christian woman is a co heir of Christ, a co heir of Christ's kingdom. It's just not her husband is a co-heir. She is a co-heir. Now, you don't get any better than that. You, you, there's, you can't get any better than that. And, and I am tired of those outside of biblical Christianity taking passages of Scripture like this and say, see, there goes those misogynist men once again demeaning wives, women, and trying to put them down. What? I'm declaring women who are in Christ to be co-heirs of God's kingdom. I cannot give you a better status, a better identity than to be a co-heir of Christ himself. If anything, Biblical Christianity has done. It has raised the status of women who believe in God. It doesn't demean them, it raises them up to be co-heirs. And now let me say something to you singles, women mainly, but also to you guys. You don't have to be married to have significance. If you're a Christian, you're a co-heir. What, what greater identity do you need? And, and if you are a wife, and if you are a wife and a mother, let me say something really important to you. That's not your most important identity. My wife's most important identity is not wife. It's not mother. She enjoys that, and we honor her because of that role, but her most important identity is Christian. She will reign and rule with Christ into eternity. Biblical Christianity has done nothing but elevate the status and the value and the worth of women. And don't let anybody say any different. Okay, that was all free. That was just a, an added soapbox. Husbands, we have the opportunity to enjoy the grace of our salvation with our wives. What could be better than that? When we show them honor, God says, enjoy life. Enjoy salvation, both now and what is to come. 
You both are co-heirs of my salvation, and I will grant you grace, grace to enjoy life. Remember, a marriage without grace is no marriage at all. But when you leave room for God's grace, you can make it, and you can enjoy everything God has intended for you. Now, fellas, if you don't do that, if you refuse to grant your wife honor and enjoy your marriage as co-heirs of the grace of your life, God's saying, why in the world would I listen to your prayers? When you choose to be disobedient, why would you then pray to me and expect me to respond? No, I'm not gonna listen. You obey first. You honor your wives. Enjoy the grace that I've given you. And then I'll heed your prayers. <laughs> 